Okay, I have 205. Um, just to check again one more time, everybody can see uh, the screen, the PowerPoint I'm sharing, and can hear me correct. Thank you. Um, so I hit the record button. All right. Okay, perfect. So um, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for everyone who coming in today and joining the tutoring session for message. Um, just a little bit about myself. My name is uh, Kwa, and I'm currently a fifth semester nursing student here uh, in our program. This is my first time tutoring message one. Uh, I have only tutored message two before, um, but um, I believe you guys definitely could do it. Uh, I think in my opinion, message is a, a important class in a nurse in nursing school because um, it's all the foundation is, it's built up all of, for all of the classes. Um, in this class, you guys will learn a lot about uh, different diseases and vital signs, and also um, the basic care uh, that we need to do for our patients. Um, so last week we didn't have uh, a tutoring session, so that's why this week I go I will have to cover two con two week content, which is perioperative and diabetes. So um, I decided uh, I will go ahead and do diabetes first because that is what you guys are going to cover tomorrow. Um, so that uh, is the beginning of the sessions. You will be, will be more focused and able to absorb more information. And the perioperative, um, we do it uh, right after the diabetes. Okay, so uh, before we get started, I would really, um, uh, appreciate if you guys can scan the code uh, right here on the screen and um, sign in as attendance so that um, the College of Nursing, uh, my manager, she will uh, have the head count of how many people came and um, they can maintain the uh, tutoring program uh, for future nursing students and for your next semester too. So I'll leave it here for about um, one minute and then I'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, while waiting for everyone to get signed in, I just wanna say if you guys ever have any questions, um, feel free to uh, text me, email me, or if it's during the tutoring lesson, just go ahead and input in the chat. Um, I am very open to answering questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll definitely um, get the answer for you guys one way or another. Okay, um, I'll put this one uh, up against at the end so that uh, we can sign in again. All right, so just some ground rules. Uh, the time is weekly. Uh, the time for the tutor session is weekly at 2 p.m. Tuesday, and it's going to be live on Zoom. All of these are recorded uh, into my computer, and I will post it on um, my uh, on the YouTube, and then the link will be posted on your group cohort later on today. So this is my email. If you guys have any, again, if you guys have any, any questions, just go ahead and email me uh, or direct message me on Facebook. Okay, tip for studying this class. So this is my personal uh, tips, how I study for this class. Obviously, I struggle the same as you guys. Uh, message was a hard class. Uh, all the information are news, but it is doable. It's really highly um, memorization. So what I usually do is every lecture, I, re I use my iPhone to record uh, Professor Lanaza lectures. And then um, I listen to uh, the lecture again on my free time um, after class. Uh, then I literally just type everything down in a Word document while listening to her lectures and um, literally every single word that she said, so that you guys know what she emphasized on. Um, and usually when she emphasized on something a lot that will go, be, will go to be on the test. So that's why I was able to have my own notes to come back and refer to uh, uh, in later on semester as well. So I highly recommend recording her lecture and make your own notes. 
Um, again, repeat, repeat and memorization. This course, there's a lot of lab values. There's a lot of um, uh, side effects or uh, assessment findings that per, um, that uh, specific to a disease that you can need to memorize in, a, in, a, in order to uh, figure out what kind of disease is that. Uh, finish all homework, every grade counts, doesn't matter, doesn't matter if it's 5%, 10% of the overall course, every single assignment, um, we just need to put 100% of our work into it uh, to get the most out of it. You guys want to be safe before the HESI. You guys um, don't want to make the HESI become the determination of your A, between A's and B's, or between failing and passing. Um, read rationales, even the correct ones. So when you guys do practice questions, uh, even though that's you get guess the correct answer, still read the rationale to see um, what other information that uh, we can benefit from it. And then read before class and attend tutor session. Uh, so um, here I would try because we are one day ahead of your class, so you. So come to tutor session and you guys be able to a little bit familiar with the topic that you guys are going to cover tomorrow in class. So you you be when you understand more about the topic and being teach being taught once more again by Professor Lanasa, it uh, retain the information more. Okay, so with that being said, um, we are going to go ahead and start our tutor session today. Uh, like I said earlier, we are going to cover diabetes first. So diabetes is so, so, so common. It's appear on every test. Uh, it's definitely going to appear on your um, HESI at the end of the semester. And also it will follow you guys up until fifth semester taking NCLEX. Um, it's not hard. It's just a lot of um, memorization that we need for diabetes. But when you get, get the hang of it, you'll be able to understand and distinguish between the type, the medications, and also the insulin. Uh, so diabetes, the, this is the four main thing that we're going to cover for this chapter, type one, type two, insulin and diabetic oral medications. So type one diabetes. Type one diabetes, um, I put, so my PowerPoint is very dry. I don't have any pictures, but all the information on here is information that I have condensed um, so that it's very short, straight to the point. Uh, we don't have to read too much. Uh, so this is a short version of um, all of the content and the important thing that I think you guys need to know or should know. So um, if you guys see it's too boring, um, yeah, it's just my style. Um, so Type 1 diabetes, before we get into the assessment findings, um, what is it? Type 1 diabetes is insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. It is a chronic illness characterized by the body's inability to produce insulin due to the autoimmune destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas. So type 1 diabetes, first thing to take away is it is an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune meaning the body attack itself. That's, that means autoimmune. And this is a chronic illness. So um, it happened for a long period of time. And usually type 1 diabetes is diagnosed um, in uh, teenagers, children, uh, mostly. And this is autoimmune, meaning it's, uh, it's occurred naturally inside the body. So the sign symptom of a person who may have type 1 diabetes is polyuria polydipsia, polyphagia, fatigue, weight loss, ketone in the urine, ketoacidosis, and DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. So there's so many words right here. Uh, so let's break down. What does it mean? Polyuria, poly is a lot. Ura is like, you know, urine, pee. So polyuria is the person who have type 1 diabetes pee excessively. They pee a lot. Polydipsia um, is when they have excessive thirst. So when they pee a lot, they lose a lot of their fluid in the body. So obviously they're gonna get thirsty. Polyphagia, so polyphagia is they have um, an increased uh, appetite. So they always um, want to eat. Um, fatigue, uh, weight loss, ketones in the urine. They have ketones in the urine is why. So basically ketones and ketoacidosis, 
ketone is an acid. Um, it is a molecule, uh, a byproduct when the body breaks down fat. So in type 1 diabetes, because the body does not produce insulin, so when someone who have diabetes type 1 eats something that have glucose, sugars, for example, bread, or drink a cup of Starbucks, their blood sugar going to go high, but because they don't have insulin, the body kills the beta cell. There's no insulin produced. So the body cannot utilize the glucose that was ingested by that person to uh, nurture to 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 create nutrients for other organs so uh, the human body would try to to break down that person fat in order to produce atp energy for the body instead of break down glucose because without insulin they cannot break down glucose so when they break down fat it will create ketones which is an acid byproduct of the process of breaking down fat in order to obtain energy for the body. And when the body have such a high amount of ketone, the body will go into um, the mode called ketoacidosis and it will lead to uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, which I will explain further later. So, so that's a little bit of it. Um, type two diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a major problem of insulin resistance and impaired insulin secretions. So different with type 1 diabetes, type 2 is not autoimmune. Type 2 is acquired. The person, uh, the person, uh, the ob obese person eats, uh, uh, have a, a, an unhealthy diet over an extensive period of time, uh, which leads to their pancreas having issues uh, with producing uh, insulin or the insulin they produce is not uh, as effective uh, in terms of um, utilizing the glucose in order to turn it into energy anymore. So that's why that person uh, have issues with uh, high blood sugars because the insulin is not working effectively uh, or they don't have enough secretion of insulin anymore because of their uh, unhealthy lifestyle. So signs symptoms of type 2 diabetes include recurrent infections, fatigue, polyuria, polydipsia, can have weight loss or weight gain, recurrent va vaginal yeast or candidas. So the thing about type 2 diabetes patients, they usually have a low immune system as well. So that's why they often get recurrent infections and recurrent vaginal yeast or, can uh, yeast or candidas. So if a patient came in and they, um, we assess the patient and they have a history of recurrent infection um, and they, we check the blood sugar and the blood sugar is high, um, we can suspect that they may have um, diabetes or prediabetes type two. And of course, uh, polyuria, polydipsia, uh, they have excessive uh, urination and excessive uh, thirst. Okay, so we talk about diabetes and insulin and stuff. So what does high blood sugars do to the body? So the whole main function of insulin is to utilize the glucose that we ingested inside our body and turn it into energy. But because the insulin is impaired, the blood sugar level in the body remains super high and sugar molecules are these sharp, tiny molecules that can, when it flows through the blood vessel, it causes these micro tears. It's very sharp, so it tear up the blood vessel inside our body. And you know, you guys know that blood vessel, if it's not uh, smooth, uh, if, if it's not smooth and it gets scarring and it gets uh, tear up by these small sharp sugar molecule, it will build up all these scar tissues and impede, and it, it will um, prevent the blood flow uh, smoothly. So when the blood doesn't flow as good, it causes issue with tissue perfusion uh, in the long term. Um, moreover, the, uh, the the these the scarring from the uh, tear up of the sugar molecule causes to the blood vessel can cause thickening of the vessel membrane um, and um, it can cause damaging to the, uh, the, the, the eyes, 
uh, there's a lot of blood vessel in the eyes and it can cause something called retinopathy, um, which can lead to adult blindness, glaucoma, cataract. These are long-term effects of someone who have sustained high blood sugars. Um, they can cause kidney neuro neuropathy. So basically, because of the damage to the blood vessel, the, there's no blood coming to these area. And whenever there's no, no blood or not enough blood going to the eye, you get blind. Whenever there's not enough blood perfusing the kidney, you get neuro neuropathy and nerves. Uh, neuropathy, uh, the patient, that's why you guys can usually see or heard a patient who have diabetes, they have tingling in the fingers and toes because the blood vessel over there is jacked up because of the scarring. So they don't have the blood vessel, the blood go through there. So they don't have the feeling, the sensation. Uh, disease of large and medium sized blood vessel, for example, heart attack, MI, stroke, Again, the blood vessel go to the heart is jacked up, uh, is scarred, so the blood does not flow uh, as well over there. And cerebral vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. Cerebral vascular disease is stroke, anything related to the brain. Cardio is the heart. Peripheral vascular disease is peripheral of your, your arms, your legs, your Okay, uh, before moving on, is there any questions or you guys good so far? If, am I speaking too fast or everything is good? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, let's move on to diagnostic study for So uh, there's a question. So in a nutshell, high blood sugars affect blood flow. Um, I would say high blood sugar, um, it affects the blood vessel. It causes scarring in the blood vessel, which then in turn will affect blood flow. But that's long-term. If someone has sustained high blood sugar over a long period of time. You're welcome. Uh, I hope that helps. Uh, diagnostic study for diabetic diabetes mellitus. So uh, there are different diagnostic tests uh, that we do. Usually the most common one is the finger stick that you guys, when going to clinical, you guys will be able to perform on patients. This is a straightforward um, uh, procedure, but it able to tell us the patient blood sugars level. So finger stick, a random blood sugar, um, you guys, doesn't have to worry about when did the patient eat or did the patient fast uh, before the test. Uh, none of that is related to the finger stick random blood sugar test. So if randomly we check some one blood sugar and if and it is over 200 and they have diabetes mellitus symptoms such as polydipsia, polyuria, um, and uh, polyphagia, um, we can suspect that they have diabetes and we need to repeat the test one more time to make sure that we get the correct number. And then we have to notify it and do more tests. But this is not a confirmatory test. This is just a suspected test. You know what I mean? It's not confirmed that the patient have diabetes mellitus. Next, we have something called fasting plasma glucose. So in the name, uh, we already know, kind of know what it is. It, what it is. So fasting plasma glucose mean that the patient have to fast usually six to eight hours before the, um, the test. So when we do this test for the patient, uh, the patient have to fast. And then um, ideal range for someone who fasted six to eight hours, their blood sugar should be from 70 to 100. If the level is more than 126, they can have diabetes mellitus. However, this is still not a confirmatory test. We need to do more tests in order to confirm, make a diagnosis that this patient is diabetes, have diabetes. This is just a suspected test, a test that guarant the that guarant us to do more tests in order to confirm it. Next, we have something called two-hour plasma glucose level. Uh, so this is called um, 
oral glucose tolerance test, OGTT. If it's greater than 200, uh, that the patient uh, also might have uh, the um, uh, diabetes. We suspect that they have diabetes mellitus. So for this one, it's more control. The patient, the patient, um, we give the patient 75 gram of carbohydrate or glucose. Um, and then after that, two hour, after two hours, we recheck the blood sugar after we given them that 75 gram of blood sugar level of, of glucose. And then if it's more than 200, they, that means that they, um, they are suspecting of having diabetes mellitus. Uh, next, we have a 1C test. So this test is a very common test, and this is a very um, accurate test that usually done for a lot of diabetic patients. So A1C uh, test is reflects glucose level over the past two, three months. So this patient cannot cheat or cannot um, stop eating like a whole day before the test in order to get a low blood sugar level. They cannot because this test will measure their blood sugar level throughout the whole two, three months. So if the test is 6.5% or higher, it indicates that the patient have diabetes. Indicate diabetes meaning confirm that the patient have diabetes if the test is 6.5% or higher. So this test is called glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. The goal, so the goal for someone who have diabetes and when we check the test for them is to, to have the, the A1C between 6.5 to 7% uh, in order to, for all of the complications that I mentioned above to, to be reduced, the risk. Like their eyes, and their retinopathy, their neuropathy and stuff like that. Uh, a good management of A1C is less than seven and a bad management of A1C is more than eight, meaning that someone who, have di who are diabetic, um, their A1C, if it's less than seven, that means that that person is responsible. That person, even though they have diabetics, but they care about the diet and they have been making changes so that the blood sugar level is less than seven. A bad management A1C is more than eight, meaning that that person who have di who, who are diabetic, uh, but they don't care about the diet. They eat a lot of um, the stuff that uh, are not healthy for themselves and causes blood sugar level to sustain high over a long period of time so that it, the A1C will reflect it uh, over eight. And they will have higher risk of neuropathy, nephropathy, and MI stroke, stuff like that. All right, so apart from the A1C, which is one of the confirmatory uh, tests for diabetes, um, this is the procedure on how someone can be diagnosed with diabetic. So first, first, when a person come in to the hospital and they want to know whether if they have diabetes or not, we check their fasting blood glucose level. So they have to be nothing by mouth and PO for six to eight hours. And then if it's more than 126, we do not, we do more tests. Next, we do a finger stick random glucose test. And if this is, this is on another date, but uh, this is the sequence of how we do things. We need to do another test of casual finger stick random glucose. And if it is two, more than 200, they, they can do another test, which is the OGT test that I mentioned earlier. So in this OGT test, we give the patient 75 gram of carb, like I said earlier, and then we check in two hours. If it's more than 200, we confirm that the patient have diabetes. So they have to go through all these three steps. It doesn't necessarily have to be on one date, but they have to go through all these tests in order to confirm that they have diabetes. And then after they have diabetes, usually the A1C test, the, the three-month test is the test to, to look at how well they manage the diabetes. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so sick day rule for diabetic diabetes mellitus individuals. So patients who are diabetic, they are at high risk for 
increasing their blood sugar whenever they stress. So whenever we stress, for example, we're having an exam or we're going through issue with our relationships or even we uh, have surgery on our body, that causes stress and the stress will cause us increase in um, blood sugar. Being sick can cause us stress. So if a diabetic patient is sick, their blood sugar will increase because sick causes stress and increase and stress causes increase in blood sugars. So people with di so people diabetic patients when they sick they need more coverage. They need to check their blood sugar every four hours and they should not exercising on sick sick day. What does it mean by needing more coverage? Meaning that they might if they are a uh, type one diabetes, they might need more insulin. Uh, if they type two diabetes, which usually they take oral medication, then they may need even insulin to cover the extra blood sugar that, um, that increase because of the stress. So that's it. So exercise for diabetes mellitus. So why do we care about exercise for diabetes mellitus? Because these diabetic patients need to exercise. However, in order to exercise, they need to get a medical clearance before they can do that. The doctor have to clear them before they can go exercise. Not every single time, but you know, like they might get a clearance. Um, so then before they exercise, they need to check their blood sugar. They need to snack before they exercise, um, usually 75 gram of carb or something like that. Uh, exercise can drop blood sugar up to 48 hours. That's good to know. Uh, exercise one hour after a meal or have 10 to 15 gram of carb carbohydrate snack and check glucose before exercise. Sorry, earlier I mentioned 75 gram, which is incorrect. So before you uh, exercise, you only eat like about 10 to 15 gram of carbs, uh, like one hour after meal or have 10 to 15 gram of carb snack and check glucose before exercise. Um, so someone who are diabetic, they should exercise at the same time every day, roughly about 30 minutes a day and three to four days a week. Okay, hypoglycemia. What is hypoglycemia? Hypo meaning low, glycemia is sugar, so low sugar. Anything with blood sugar less than 70, is a medical emergency. If you guys go into clinical, you guys check blood sugar of a random person and their blood sugar is 70, you need to run to your nurse and report that because that is a medical emergency. If someone who are hypoglycemic, they can pass, they can um, like black out. Um, However, some patients don't show symptoms, so we must act on it. So the sign of hypoglycemia uh, is usually cold, clammy skin, numbness, tachycardia, emotion changes, headache, nervous, tremor, faintness, a lot. But the thing that I want you guys to remember is cold and clammy skin. They tachycardia, the heart rate increases significantly. They have dizzy, they have slurred speech, they have seizure and coma or drowsy, and they can be irritability and or difficulty speaking. Um, so if you guys go into a patient room and you guys check on the patient and you guys see that the patient is quite cold, but their skin is clammy, is sticky and is sweaty. And um, you guys check the pulse, the heart rate, and it's so fast. And uh, the patient is not very responsive we need to check the blood sugar. And then if it's if less than 70, it is hypoglycemia, it is a medical emergency. So uh, this is a trick that uh, I was told in class, cold and clammy gives candy, uh, gives candy, you know, increase their blood sugar. So when someone who have hypoglycemia, how do we treat it? So there's a rule called rules of 15. So this is must known by all of the ER nurse who, nurses who work in the ER, or every nurse should know this. This is called rule of 15. Um, it consumes 15 grams of a simple carbohydrate. 
uh, fruit juice, apple juice, regular soft drink, or gel so or tablets. Uh, and then we recheck glucose level in 15 minutes. So you guys check someone who blood sugar level is like 60. Okay, so what's the first thing to do? We give them some fruit juice or we give them uh, a glucose gel or something that around 15 grams of carbs. And then we check that person blood glucose level again, 15 minutes later. If after 15 minutes, after 15 minutes of giving the apple juice and the regular soft drink and their blood sugar is still less than 70, um, we have to continue giving them 15 more grams of fruit juice or 15 more grams of gel, tablets, or anything like that. And um, uh, we do it up to two or we do it up to three times. And if after three times and the blood sugar level does not increase, and it's still below 70, we need to contact the doctor, the healthcare provider. We avoid over-treatment. We don't just put sugar or peanut butter into the mouth. Um, and if the patient cannot swallow, like they're not responsive and they cannot swallow, we, they don't respond to us, we can give them the gel so that it can absorb through their, um, uh, their mouth. Um, treatment for acute setting, uh, if patient unable to take any oral intake, we give them 50% dextro, which is this huge tube that have like 50% of like dextro sugars in it. And they will, do, they will put it into the IV, IV port on the patient IV line, and then they push it. Uh, usually for dextro, they need a large IV pore because the dextro liquid inside the syringe is very thick and it's hard to infuse. Next, we learn about hypoglycemia. Now we have hyperglycemia. So glycemia is sugar and hyper meaning high. So anything more, anything large, anything larger or equal to 151 means that the patient have hyperglycemia. Okay. So, so far we have some number, some tests that we guys can remember already, right? So Hypoglycemia is less than 70, and anything more than 151 means that the patient have hyperglycemia. So the sign of someone who have, might have hyperglycemia is um, the three Ps, polydipsia, polyphagia, and poly, uh, polydipsia, polyphagia, and uh, polyuria. So they will have elevated blood glucose, increased urinations, blur vision, glycose, urea, meaning that they pee sugar, progression of DKA or HHS, which I will discuss later. Uh, they have mood swing and dehydration, dry mouth, poor skin turgor, high pose, low blood pressure, sunken eyes, fluid electrolyte imbalances. So this last symptom is very important, especially the dehydration and the fluid electrolyte imbalances. Why does someone who have high blood sugar might be dehydrated? The reason for that is our body is fluid and the blood is fluid. And when the blood contains so much sugar molecule, um, the osmolality level increases. So it causes uh, dehydration in the body. So whenever someone who have high level of molecules, uh, the osmolality, um, it's it just causes dehydration. I'm not sure how to explain it very well, but um, it has to do with the um, hypertonic uh, and the osmolarity of the blood. Uh, but if one who have sustained hyperglycemia uh, over a long period of time, they can have fluid and electrolyte imbalances and causes severe issues with um, the perfusion of the body. Treatment, we get Medicare if it gets too high, uh, meaning that we can give them insulin. Uh, we continue diabetic, uh, diabetes medication as prescribed. We check blood glucose and urine for ketones. Uh, we, we drink fluid hourly because they are dehydrated, so we have to give them fluid um, hourly. Uh, we contact the doctor um, if we find out that their urine contains ketones. Goal is to keep glucose level below 180. We don't want anything higher than that because that is very um, um, lethal to the body. 
frequent blood sugar monitor. Why hyperglycemia is dangerous? It can cause dehydration, sunken eyes, high pulse, decreased blood pressure, dry mouth, and poor skin turgor. So whenever we have we are dehydrated inside our body. We don't have enough fluid, right? So when we don't have enough fluid, the heart had to beat faster in order to uh, bring the fluid, perfuse the fluid to the rest of the body. It had to beat faster. So that's why it causes high pulse. Why does it cause decreased blood pressure? Because we dehydrated, the volume of the blood is lower. There's not a lot of volume in the blood anymore. Therefore, the pressure uh, that it will be also lower as well. And then poor skin turgor because we dehydrate it. Uh, this leads to fluid and electrolyte imbalance, especially it messed up the chloride, sodium, and potassium. Ultimately, it leads to hypovolemic shock, low blood pressure, high pulse, high respiratory rate. Um, you guys, I don't know if you guys covered this already, but basically hypovolemic shock is the body go into a state of shock whenever we don't have enough blood volume to circulate around the body. And this is the three classic signs symptom of someone who might have hypovolemic shock. They have low blood pressure, they have high pulse tachycardia, and they have high respiratory rate. All right, so we talk about DKA and um, what does it mean, DKA? So like I mentioned a little bit about uh, type one diabetes earlier. Uh, so yeah, DKA is only present in type one diabetes. Patient who have type two diabetes does not have DKA. So you guys need to know that whenever there's an exam question about DKA, immediately think it is about type one diabetes, autoimmune disease, okay? So I talked about type one diabetes earlier on how the body does not have insulin inside the body and the body have to um, break down fat in order to uh, convert it into energy, ATP in order for the part body to use. So when they break down fat, it uh, release this byproduct, which is the ketone. And this byproduct is very acidic and it, it, caught, it make the blood pH level uh, lower, it make it causes to be the blood to be more acidic. So um, the characteristic of the DKA is hyperglycemia, meaning high blood sugars. Uh, they have ketosis, uh, meaning ketone in the blood, ketone in the urine, acidosis, because ketone is very acidic, it makes the blood going to um, it makes the blood pH level going down. So it causes metabolic acidosis, remember, metabolic, uh, and it causes dehydration. You guys remember because of the high blood sugar, high blood sugar causes dehydration. So this patient will have dehydration. And whenever they are dehydrated, the heart needs to beat faster so that they can deliver more blood to the rest of the body. So they have tachycardia, meaning high blood, high pulse, high pulse rate. And then they have hypotension because the volume of the blood is so low, so they have low blood pressure. Hypokalemia, meaning low potassium level, and we will talk about why. Polyuria is excessive peeing, and thirsty is poly, um, polyuria, polydipsia, and poly. I don't remember what was the poly uh, for thirsty. Um, so um, dehydration sign will show as poor skin turgor, dry mucus, tachycardia, orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension is basically when they stand up so fast, they get dizzy. Polydipsia is thirsty. Yes, thank you, Lakin. Early sign is lethargy and weaknesses. So they get very lethargy and they get weak. As progress, the skin become dry and loose, the eyes soft and sunken. Whenever they say sunken eyes, they definitely think about dehydration, guys. Sunken eyes is the classic sign of dehydration. Nausea and vomiting. So one of the biggest sign, one of the biggest sign in DKA is cush mouth respiration with sweet 
fruity breath odor like acetone. So when a patient have Kusmo respiration, we will smell a, a sweet fruity breath odor from them uh, or like a smell of acetone. So that is a classic sign of DKA. So there's a question. Will DKA always present as hyperglycemia before it gets worse and then turns into DKA? Um, so DKA is basically hyperglycemia. Um, hyperglycemia lead to DKA. A, per, a type one diabetic patient, when they don't, when they eat a lot of uh, food uh, high in carbohydrate, but they don't want to take insulin. Their blood sugar can go in high rocket. And over time, if they don't change it for like a few hours uh, and they, don't, they still don't um, use the insulin that they are prescribed, um, they, they can go into DKA and it, they'll feel all of this. They'll feel like the nausea and vomiting. They'll feel dehydrated. So yes, so DKA always present at hyperglycemia. Their blood sugar have to be high first and it have to be over a period of time and then it will turn into DKA if they don't take insulin. Okay. Um, so their blood sugar will usually be more or equal to 250. So we can see that some patients who have type one diabetes can go into DKA if they don't have the insulin and the blood sugar can be in the 600 range. And that's just crazy. But if any blood sugar more than 250 or equal to 250 and that person have ketones inside their blood or their urine, they are diagnostic with DKA, the diabetic ketoacidosis, okay? The blood sugar will be lower than 7.30. So we know that blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45, right? So lower than 7.35, meaning the blood get more acidic. So the range of the pH blood in DKA patient will be around 7.30. Serum HCO3, which is the bicarbonate, will be less than 16, okay? So bicarbonate is a um, alkaline, it is a buffer for the body. The lower it gets, the less buffer we have. So the less buffer we have, meaning that the blood will get more acidic and uh, moderate to high ketone level in the urine. Cosmo, again, this is a classic sign of someone who have DKA. They will have deep rabbit breathing. Cosmo, deep rabbit breathing. They have very deep, but very rapidly. Uh, when the respiration rate and the body temperature and because the body trying to uh, expel the carbon dioxide inside the body. Uh, why does the body do that? Because the body can sense that inside our body, the blood pH is so acidic and carbon dioxide is acidic. So the body trying to compensate for that by trying to breathe rapidly so that we can expel the carbon dioxide out faster. So we have less carbon dioxide, meaning that the blood will be a little bit more alkaline and not too much acidic because carbon dioxide is acidic. The goal of DKA is to prevent hypovolemic shock. Again, hypovolemic shock is the shock whenever the body senses that the body is so dehydrated or there's not enough blood volume or fluid volume that's circulating throughout the body. Next, so emergency management. So DKA is a medical emergency. So, um, so usually patient who diagnosed with DKA is the one that who, who are teenagers and they play sport and they've never known that they have type one diabetes before, and suddenly they pass out on the, on, on the playground. And then um, they got to the emergency and they test the urine and they see ketone and check the blood sugar and it was high skyrocket. That's when they know that they have DKA and they have type one diabetes. So that usually when that's happened. So how do we treat DKA? So we need to always, always with nursing, we need to ensure a patient have a patent airway and we need to administer oxygen for them. We need to establish IV access. 
begin normal saline or have normal saline, which is isotonic fluid to prevent dehydration. So I'd like you guys to highlight this sentence right here, begin normal saline or have normal saline and isotonic fluid. I remember students day, I have a question uh, about this on message one exam. Um, normal saline and half normal saline is isotonic fluid. Um, and it will help to prevent the dehydration of someone who are in DKA. Simultaneously start IV insulin regular short acting. So when, when they have IV access, they have two IV access. We have one on each, uh, each side of the hand. And then uh, on, one, on one side, we administer the normal saline or the half normal saline. And on the other side, we administer the insulin. Uh, and this must be IV insulin, okay? It's not just a syringe where we poke the patient and push the insulin in. This must be IV, meaning that they have a bag of insulin that hang and then need, go through a pump. So it's IV insulin. And it must be regular insulin, okay? Regular insulin, short acting one. There are different kinds of insulin, rapid, short, intermediate, and long acting. So for this purpose, for the treatment of DKA, please remember it is regular short acting uh, insulin. When blood sugar reach 250 or lower, we change the fluid to dextro 5% to 10% added to normal saline or half normal saline. Okay. So for example, a patient coming in with 600 blood sugar level, and then um, we, administ we administer normal saline, we administer IV regulars, insulin, and then the, now the blood sugar from 600, it dropped down to about 250. Now, instead of giving the normal saline, which we initially start with, we change it to another solution. It's called dextro 5%. Uh, to switch with the normal saline. The reason for this is to decrease the risk of cerebral edema, prevent fluid overload, and not to cause too rapid decrease of blood sugars. Okay, so now after we get the blood sugar from 250, we change to the dextro and now it's lower and why we still continuing the IV regular insulin. Uh, now the blood sugar is lower to about 200, we slow down the fluid like about 50% and then we take off the insulin. We discontinue the insulin, okay? And then we just monitor the patient from then, from there. Uh, so when the patient plus sugar gets to less than 200, that means that we already passed the critical stage, the emergency state of DKA. So that's mean that the patient getting more stable and we getting the blood sugar stabilizing. So throughout this process, we need to monitor for potassium because it will drop due to the administer of insulin. Whenever you guys give insulin to, or an excessive amount of insulin to a human body, the insulin will shift the potassium in the blood back into the cells and causes hypokalemia, meaning that low level of potassium. And potassium level is so crucial for the body why? Because potassium level, which is 3.5 to 5, if it's out of range, if it's less than 3.5 or it's more than 5, it can cause issue with the rate rhythm of the heart, dysrhythmia. So that's why we need to monitor the potassium when we give the uh, insulin uh, to treat DKA. And um, potassium is pre predominantly intracellular. All right, so we talk about DKA. Now it, it is HHS syndrome. Um, so DKA is only present in type one diabetes. However, uh, HHA is only present in type two diabetes. So type one DKA, type two HHS. So everything between DKA and HHS is similar. The only difference is no ketone is found in the urine. So we cannot find ketone in the urine when someone who have type two diabetes and have HHS. The treatment is the same thing. Okay, so before I move on, um, 
do you guys have any questions uh, that I can answer right now or you guys doing okay? I know it's a lot of information. Okay, nope, so I'm just gonna move on. Uh, so next we have uh, something called, we have insulin. So from this, I don't um, provide the information for you guys because you guys can find this information on the textbook and also the uh, drug books. And I think it will be more helpful that way, um, especially regarding to insulin. So just some main thing about insulin, they have rapid acting insulin, short acting insulin, intermediate and long acting insulin. So the main thing to learn for insulin is name of each drug from each class, onset, peak duration of each class, which one can be mixed and which one cannot be mixed. So please take a picture of this slide and then um, make yourself a table of all of these insulin and the main thing to learn. It will be on the exam, guys, I guarantee. Okay, so the same with anti-diabetic drugs. I'm not going to co going to cover it, but I have formed the information right here for you guys. So you guys can go over and um, look at it later. Uh, I will post the PowerPoint together with the YouTube link uh, on your cohort page. So uh, medication, I don't really go over with you guys, um, but um, I have made the, the slices for you guys so it's easier for you guys to go over with and it will be on um, the exam, okay? So for anti-diabetic drugs, remember anti-diabetic drug, oral drug, when you take orally, you guys, this is only for type two diabetes, okay? Type one diabetes cannot take any oral medication. No oral medication for type one diabetes. Type one diabetes only use insulin. Type two diabetes, they only use uh, oral medication, but during the sick time, during the time when they stress, um, we use more of the, um, we can use insulin with type two, but type one, we never use oral medication, okay? And it will be on exam guide. If it's not on the exam, it will be on the medical medication quiz. And I think she have medication quiz every third week or something. I'm not sure. So yeah, so please go over this drug. So yeah, I will post the PowerPoint and also the uh, uh, the link of the YouTube. Uh, this is not the end, you guys. We have the perioperative to go over. Uh, so um, right now we're going to have a break. Uh, let's have a five minute break and then we come back. Uh, do you guys have any questions for right now before we uh, we on break? or you guys need anything? Can you repeat the mess for tap one? Yes, absolutely. So I was uh, mentioned earlier. So um, for type one diabetes, we don't give them and we don't give them anti-diabetic oral medications. So the only medication that type one diabetes patient gets is the insulin. For patients who have type two diabetes, they will be given anti-diabetic oral medication to treat their insulin problems. But sometime during the time of stress, for example, they go to, through a surgery, we can also give them insulin for type two diabetes as well. But we don't give oral anti-diabetic medication for type one. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, I have 259 right here. We're gonna come back at 304 for perioperative. Peri thank you, you guys. To pause recording. All right. Let's start. So now we have we got we are going to go over um, perioperative. 
So perioperative is the uh, process of uh, from preoperative, during operation, and postoperative. So preoperative start when the patient decides to have the surgery and it goes up to the transfer to the holding room. So that is the whole period of when preoperative happens. What do we teach the patient? We teach them what should they expect when they wake up, things to do to prevent the complications. So for example, we teach them how to use insomative parameter, uh, spirometer, uh, deep breathing, deep copying, stuff like that. Next, we have uh, during the perioperative, the preoperative, we need to assess the patient. We need to assess them for latex, latex, medications, and food allergies. So, healthcare work, healthcare rubbery industry worker, uh, people who are allergic to eggs, avocados, bananas, potato, chestnut, peaches, kiwi, carrot, tomato, celery, also potentially allergic to latex. So if the, if the patient is allergic to like bananas or avocados, we can suspect that they have an allergic reaction to latex. Or for example, a patient allergic to selfish or salmon, they might be allergic to iodine. And we need to uh, make sure that we know about their allergy information and we need to notify it in the document and also to the healthcare provider. So we assess, uh, for are they MPO? Have they been uh, fasting this whole time before the surgery? Uh, so MPO should start at midnight, the night before the surgery. This reduces pulmonary aspiration and nausea and vomiting. So what is pulmonary aspiration? Pulmonary aspiration is basically there um, when they under anesthesia or when they in during the operation and they have food or fluid inside their uh, stomach. This food or fluid can regurgitate back up and go into the trachea and causes issue with the lungs. And that's, that is called aspiration and nausea and vomiting. Um, six to eight hours, uh, MPO is minimum for food. With six is light meal and over eight for regular meal like steak, chicken, light meal is like uh, scrambled eggs, toast. So it should be two hours for clear liquid. What is clear liquid? Water, clear tea, black coffee, carbonated drink, fruit juice, no pulp, or even gelatin, but the plain, the plain one. So we need to start taking all herbs two to three weeks before any kind of surgery. So why do we need to stop herbs? Because many herbal stuff, they have a, uh, properties where they uh, increases the time it takes for the blood to clot. So it increases the bleeding risk when the patient uh, going into surgery if they have been taking herbal stuff. So we need to report that to the healthcare provider or the surgeons as well. Um, if the patient is recently taking herb and have not stopped two to three weeks before the surgery. Um, they can take multivitamins until the day before the surgery and that's fine. Um, any anticoagulants, blood thinners, NSAIDs must be off 72 hours to one week before the surgery. So what are the NSAIDs? Aspirin, um, uh, aspirin is NSAIDs, uh, Advil, Thalanol, uh, those are NSAIDs as well. So they need to stop 72 hours, which is three days to, right? Yeah, three days to one week before, prior to the surgery. And then uh, anticoagulants, blood thinners, anticoagulants is, you know, the the name is self-explanatory, is uh, prevent the clotting of the blood. So it increases the, the bleeding risk for the patient if the patient go into the surgery. So that's why they need to be stopped 72 hours before or one week before the surgery. Coumadin, Plavix, Aleve, Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is an NSAID. Coumadin and Plavix is anticoagulant and blood thinners. So herbs, I mentioned herbs about earlier. So herbs, any kind of G's and E's, for example, chinka, ginger, chinko, gaiko, ginseng, vitamin E, vitamin G, or some certain oil that increases the risk for bleeding, we need to stop and tell them to stop it 
two to three weeks before the surgery. Risk factor for complication. So someone who have diabetic mellitus, if they go into a surgery, they can increase their blood sugar because surgery can cause stress. And this will lead to uh, increased risk for infections. Uh, when they have high blood sugar, they have higher risk for infection uh, because bacteria loves what? Bacteria love sugars. Infective tissue perfusion, delay wound healing. Um, COPD, uh, atelectasis, respiratory issues. So when patients go into a surgery, they usually go under anesthesia and that kind of depress their uh, breathing, uh, their CNS, their uh, central nervous system and causes issue with breathing. Uh, so uh, that, will, that may lead to atelectasis, which is uh, collapse of the lungs and uh, respiratory issues. HTN is hypertension. So if someone who, who are hypertensive and go into the uh, surgery, they may have issue with ineffective tissue perfusion due to vasoconstriction. Uh, who, someone who are obesity uh, going to the surgery, it's harder for us to intubate them. It's harder for us to sedate them and it's harder for us to transport them. So we need more, they also need more medication and it's, it takes them a longer time to go come out of the anesthesia as well. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, CKD is chronic kidney disease. So they, these patients are at risk for fluid overload. And when the patient is in anxiety stage, the heart rate is increased. If patients say, I am going to die, do not send them to the surgery because um, it will cause this issue with their blood perfusion because the heart rate is beating so fast. They are so anxious. Uh, smoking tissue, if someone who smoke, they usually have issue with tissue perfusion. Smoking causes vasoconstriction, constriction and vasoconstriction is narrowing of the blood vessel. And whenever the blood vessel is narrow, there's not enough blood to perfuse the body. Um, AFib um, is the, a dysrhythmia and it's an irregular rhythm. Uh, bleeding disorder can cause have an effect on surgery as well. Uh, patient who have a history of using cocaine stimulant can also cause vasoconstriction and having issue with tissue perfusion. Uh, so that's a pose uh, a potential risk for surgery. Okay, so please remember this. Um, always empty the patient bladder before the surgery. First of all, because when they're under anesthesia, they may not be able to control their bladder and it can mess up the uh, surgery room. So they can pee on the table or um, when the bladder is not empty, it's full, so it's bigger. So it have higher chance of um, the, the surgeon poke into the bladder and causes uh, 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 a mistake that can be, uh, can be uh, prevented. So always empty the bladder before the surgery. Pre-op medication to consider. If patient take diuretic, we need to draw the potassium levels. So diuretics is medication that causes the patient to pee a lot more. Uh, so when they pee a lot, they lose potassium. So that's why we need to draw the potassium, make sure it's in the therapeutic the regular range, normal range, so that they don't have any issue with the heart rhythm during the surgery. It, again, if the patient take any Gs and Es, herbs, or any blood thinner, we need to notify the doctor. Pre-op checklist, ID bracelet, allergy band, baseline vital sign, labs, history and physical consent must be signed, blood type, cross match, MPO status, valuable returns, and whether they void, void yet or not, meaning uh, did they empty the bladder. The role of the nurse. So in pre-op, the role of the nurse is to assess, to make sure the patient is safe. We need to interpret the data and communicate with doctor and patient educations. Teaching, oops. Um, informed consent. So please remember this. So the surgeon is the one who obtained the consent. They explain the procedure to the patients, but the nurse is the one 
obtain a signature, we obtain a signature, the surgeon, we, they just need to explain it to the patient and they obtain the consent. Um, the nurse is the person who witnessed and make sure that the patient understand and being well informed. The patient must not under any anxiety or morphine during the time of explanation uh, when the surgeon explained to the, the patient, they must not be under any kind of anxiety or morphine uh, or, any, or any medication that cloudy their, their, their mind or alter their uh, central nervous system. If there's a phone call consent, must be two registered nurse hearing and obtain the consent. Next, we have intraoperative care. Intraoperative meaning during the operation time. So during the operation time, there's the procedure calling, calling time out. So when you guys have the opportunity to go to the hospital and able to um, uh, attend one of the search, one of the operation uh, surgical, uh, you guys will see this procedure then prior to any surgical uh, procedure. So this is the purpose of timeout is to make sure everything is correct. They make, they make sure that the right patient, the right procedure, the site is marked, make sure the consent is obtained and is there. Uh, and when, what is the patient allergies and what is the procedure? Next, we have anesthesia. So anesthesia is something that um, is given to the patient during the operation, operative time in order to reduce all of their stimuli sensation so that they can go through the process of operation operative smoothly. So anesthesia will slow down central nervous system. It decreases the heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory, pulse, and it paralyzes the patients so that the patient doesn't move when they're being cut. Um, we need to intubate the patient, meaning that we need to breathe for the patient via uh, machines or manually. Usually nowadays it's machines. Uh, when come out of anesthesis, they can cause nausea and vomiting. Uh, it, they have an, we need to have an anti-emetic medication ready. So this is going to be on the exam, guys, ketamine. Um, uh, ketamine is an anesthesia agent uh, that could cause hallucination. So the thing about ketamine we must remember is to whenever the surgeon or the, the anesthesiologist or the CRNAs, uh, they administer ketamine, uh, it must be given in a quiet environment during and when getting out of the surgery. If there are noises or um, like loud noises or talking during the administration of ketamine, it can lead to hallucination uh, that the patient might experience like a really bad hallucination. All right, role of the nurse uh, during operative, um, periop during the operative time is to, is safety and comfort. The patient needs to be positioned and aligned during the surgery. Um, they need to be padded uh, with pillow on all of the bony prominences so that pressure, we can prevent pressure ulcers or um, any bruises. Uh, the patient is strapped into the OR table uh, and the side rails are up. Uh, we need to count supply before and after the surgery to make sure that we don't forget anything inside the patients. Um, and then the patient can get hypothermia, meaning um, they, the temperature in the OR room can be low and they can get cold, uh, but they cannot tell us because they, they don't feel it. So the nurse needs to monitor the temperature for the patients and then give it a heated blanket and warm up the IV fluid when it is given to the patients. All right, so malignant hypothermia. So this is not the issues with anesthesis. So it is a, a, a rare reaction naturally uh, to anesthesia agent and usually the agent that causes malignant hyperthermia in many cases is succinylcholine. Succinylcholine is the agent that uh, have the higher uh, percentage of causing malignant hyperthermia. It increase, so during malignant hyperthermia, it increases the carbon dioxide it causes the heart rate tachy to beat really fast, tachycardia more than 150 beats per minute, and the patient becomes very rigid and 
like very um yeah increased pulse tachycardia uh muscle um they get mu the muscle get very tense uh they, they have tachypnea meaning they breathe really fast and rapidly and they may have fever and usually fever is the late sign uh so yes late finding is temperature rise so this is due to uh because the inability to regulate calcium. So what do we do during malignant hyperthermia? Uh, we give them dantrolene, which will calm the patient muscles, and uh, we give them lidocaine to calm the patient heart. So we slow down the heart rate and uh, make the muscle less rigid, less tense. And then we give them ice cooling blanket to decrease the external temperature, and we give them 100% oxygen. It is a genetic factors. History of family has issue of anesthesis. So patients who have history of malignant hyperthermia, they can still have surgery. They can still go through anesthesis. However, uh, it just have to be another agent. They cannot use succinylcholine or the agent that causes the issues uh, for them. Okay, next we have post-operative care. Post-operative care is when the patient is moved to the PACU uh, post-acute care unit uh, immediately after surgery for post-op care. So post-op assessment is we need to always, again, in nursing, airway. The first thing, prioritize airways. They need to have a stable vital sign and um, we need to get their status, uh, meaning that um, uh, the vital side and all of the line to the, uh, that are hooked up to them. Um, immediate post-op, everything is often slow. So the airway, we need to ask, is it patent? Make sure that at least respirate, uh, there are 10 respir respiratory rate per, um, if, uh, per minute. If less than 10, we cannot give pain medication because remember, pain medication, opioid narcotic causes CNS depression. It will further depress the respiratory drive and it can cause issues. So if it's less than 10, there are the respiratory rate, we do not give pain medications. Next, we have lung cells. Is it crackles? Um, if it's crackle, that means that they ha might have fluid in the lungs. Uh, breathing, the respiratory rate, the quality continuous pulse oximetry. So it's the little thing that we put on the finger to see the percentage of the oxygen in their hand, in the body. So we need to check the circulation. Um, we need to check the blood pressure. It can be slightly slow and it's about 107, 70, that's okay. Uh, neuro, we need to make sure that we need to check the level of consciousness. If it's kind of decreased because they just got out of the surgery, then that's fine. But it's continue to worsen and not improve by 30 minutes or um, to one hour, we need to concern and um, uh, notify the doctor. Monitor I and O, intake and output, estimate blood loss, bowel sound normally decrease. Uh, monitor ABC, again, airway, breathing, circulation, and vital sign every five minutes post-op. All right, what is the role of the nurse in post-op? Prevent complications. And what are the complications? So these are the complications. So this is very important, you guys. It will be on the exam. Um, so post-op complication, anytime from zero, to 24 to the first 24 hours immediately post op the patient is at risk for excessive bleeding which can lead to hypovolemic shock so again this hypovolemic hypovolemic shock again um, patient loses so much blood volume that they don't have enough blood circulate in the body and then the body go into shock sign symptom pain at the incision site it increases heart rate so heart rate increase heart rate low blood pressure um, is, the, is, is the classic sign of hypovolemic shock. Their pose will be weak and thready. They have, they'll be sweating, decreased urine output. The reason for decreased urine output is because they don't have enough blood circulating in the body. The, the heart, the body will try to uh, give the blood to the more essential organs, such as the heart and the brain, 
they won't perfuse the kidney, which is so far away from the body. So that's why when the kidney is not getting blood, it will decrease the urine output. Uh, the patient will look pale, cyanotic, uh, shortness of breath. We need to check the H and H, which is hematocrit and hemoglobin uh, to see if the patient is bleeding or thirsty. The nurse put another dressing on top until the surgeon comes and changes the first dressing. The surgeon is the person who come and change the first dressing. Treatment, we give them IV normal saline or half normal saline, which is isotonic fluid, okay? Legs up, heads down so that the blood can go to the brain so that the patient does not have any issue with the central nervous system, uh, which is the trendelibert position. And then we can give them blood product and also oxygen. If the patient is bleeding, the nurse put pressure on the bleeding side, put the patient in trendelibert position, give fluid or blood, and then call the doctor. Day one, so this is after the first 24 hours post-op. So most common issues happen is atelectasis, which is a collapse of the lungs. Atelectasis sign symptom is crackles, breath sounds, uh, the end of, yeah, don't worry about it. It's crackle breath sounds. Uh, dyspnea, asymmetric stress, expansions. Uh, this is alveoli collapse. It can progress to pneumonia if fluid sits in the lung. And uh, treatment is teach the patient to do insemitive spirometer, uh, TCDB, meaning turn, cough, deep breath, um, and then early ambulation uh, fluid position changes. A lot of these are memorization, you guys. And day two, DVT, deep vein thrombosis. So deep vein thrombosis is due to because the patient go out of the surgery, they are in pain, so they don't want to ambulate, they don't want to walk around, so they are immobilized and they lay on the bed for a period, long period of time. And whenever they lay on the bed, uh, the, the blood does, get, does not get perfused uh, well enough. It get the blood sit there, it's called blood pooling. And whenever blood is pooling, it forms little clots. And then this clot can travel from the leg to the lung or travel to the heart or the brain can cause heart attack or stroke. So that's why that is basically different thrombosis. And then side and symptom is leg, calf pain, swelling, redness, weak pulse, less palpable pulse, uh, prevention is we do a sequential compression devices. Uh, we try to get them up, walk them around, um, early ambulation, compression shocks, blood thinners. We give them Lovonox. Every time giving Lovonox must remember risk for bleeding, decreased blood pressure, high pulse, weak ready pulse, increased heart rate and respiratory rate. So I just write it for you guys again, the hypovolemic shock sign. Um, so every time we give Lovonox, we must assess for platelets. This is from Fundamental. So only give platelet if it's more than 100,000 uh, platelets, okay? And how do we give platelets? We give them sub-Q on the love handles and two inches away from the umbilicus. Day three. So infection, usually it takes three days for infection to grow can be atelectasis that progress to pneumonia or can be um, a UTI, can be an infection of the um, urinary tract. Sign and symptom, whenever we see elevation in white blood count, it means that the body is trying to uh, increase the white blood count and kill the bacteria. Uh, so that's why it's a sign of infection. They have bad odor, purulent drainage, uh, productive cough, crackle, sputum, and fever. Um, on, if they have a UTI, they can have painful and sediment cloudy urine. Sediment cloudy urine, meaning the urine will have like little bits in it that we can see, like white stuff. Um, white blood count often increase after surgery, body immune response, but if it is gradual increase, it indicate infections. Treatment, antibiotic, fluid, and hand hygiene. All right. Um, so basically that's it for the, uh, 
the peri the 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 post operative uh, complication. So how do I remember it? I remember it as BADI, uh, B A D I, which is uh, bleeding, atelectasis, um, the uh, bleeding atelectasis, and then right, sorry, deep vein thrombosis and infections. So that's how I remember it. Maddie, I put it in the chat for you guys. Uh, next, we have wound dehesion and evisceration. So this is important to remember as well. You guys need to know and distinguish between dehesion and eviscerations. So dehesion is the incision is separated and evision is the incision is separated and the stomach contents come through the wound. Um, mostly with abdominal surgery, uh, we use abdominal binder, pillow, and put patient in a low flower position uh, with the knee bent. So when the patient have evisceration, we cover the wound with moist, sterile, normal saline dressing. Moist continue to perfuse their circulation. If it's not moist, it can get necrotic. Then we call the doctor administer emetics, anti-emetic to prevent vomiting, which could put a strain on the incision. In stroke patient go to splint when coughing, remember ABC, safety, comfort, and never call a doctor if there are intervention that can be appropriate. So yes, so always cover the wound with a moisture, normal saline dressing, and then position the patient. Uh, pulmonary embolism post-op. This is clot in the lungs. So this happened usually because of the DVT, the clot form in the legs and it travel into the lung. So for this, we put the patient in high flower position so that they can breathe. The gravity can pull the diaphragm down so that it's easier for them to breathe and expand their lungs. Uh, we administer oxygen, uh, bed rest, immobilize the patient, call doctor and administer coumadin or heparin, which is the anticoagulant. The sigh is the patient feel like they are dying, chest hurt, low heart rate, high respiratory rate, and shortness of breath. Oh my God. All right, you guys, we did it. We finished today, first tutor session. Can you go back one slide? Yes. Uh, is it this slide, the pulmonary embolism? or the wound dehydration and evisceration. Day one after surgery. Day one after surgery is this one, atelectasis. Is that good? You're welcome. All right, you guys. Um, that's it for today. Um, do you guys have any more questions or anything that you guys would like me to answer uh, before we end today's sessions? Can you explain ketone in the urine again? Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, one more time. So ketone appear in the urine only in patients who have type one diabetes. So in type one diabetes, uh, the patient does not produce any insulin. Um, and then um, um, when, the, when the body does not produce insulin, so if we eat like carbohydrate, like a, a toast or some bread, uh, the, the, the glucose from the bread uh, increases the blood glucose level, but because there are no insulin in the body, the insulin cannot convert the glucose into energy, which is ATP. And if it's not convert into ATP, the body cannot use that. So even though we eat, we have high blood glucose level, the body cannot convert it into energy and use it. So in another way, the body trying to compensate for that by using fat instead of glucose, to convert fat into energy and then it, 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 it's able to use it. So during the time when it convert from fat into energy, it causes the byproduct, which is the ketones. 
and the byproduct ketones is very acidic to the body. It caught the higher the amount of ketone in the body, the more acidic the blood gets. And when the blood is so acidic, it can cause an issue with metabolic acidic acidosis and many other issues as well. So um, that is the ketones in the urine. So ketone is the byproduct of the fat burning. Um, I wouldn't say it's a fat burning. I would say, uh, yeah, it's the ketone is the byproduct of the conversion of fat into ATP, which is energy, yes. And uh, will you have the recording of literature? Yes, I will uh, post this on the YouTube. Usually it takes about two, three hours, or if it's faster, then I'll post it on. Could you also explain why anxiety was a risk factor again? Yes, absolutely. So during operation, before, operate, before any um, operation, like patient can usually get very anxious. And whenever the patient is so anxious or get too, too much anxiety, their heart will beat really fast. And when the heart beat really fast, the heart doesn't have enough time to fill up the chamber of the body uh, of the heart. So when the heart beats fast, the cardiac output, it decreases. And when cardiac output decreases, it reduces the tissue perfusion to all of the vital organ and the body. And we don't want that during the operative time. So that's why if the patients are so anxious and they say things like, I want, I, I, I would die if I go to surgery, then we cannot send them to surgery because their heart will beat really fast. They will have tachycardia. Bye, Ariana. Thank you. Was that helpful? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, Thank you so much, Guy, for joining. I really appreciate everyone for joining. Um, thank you. I will see you guys next time, and good luck tomorrow. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Thank you.